In the year nine, no, what is this? 1949, author Joseph Campbell published the book The Hero with Thousand Faces. And this book, it truly made a revolution in the field of comparative mythology. And it was first popular work to combine the spiritual and psychological insights of modern psychoanalysis with the archetypes of world mythology. Uh, Campbell presented a theory of the mythological structure of the journey of the hero found in myths across the world. And this theory was revolutionary for its time because it um, has been, since then till today, applied to a wide, wide variety of modern writings and movies and books today. And the series says that the myths share a common fundamental structure. Every myth share common fundamental structure. And this, there is a term for that, it's called monomies. And here is a description of it from the book. A hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow men. In this week's Parsha Miketz, we read the second part of the story of Joseph. And together with the previous portion by a chef and the next week by Gash, it's uh, like a three-part drama. And today we're in the second episode, so to say we're in the middle of it. And the story of Joseph is a perfect example of the monomyth. So let's look together and uncover the meaning of the details of the story and apply the theory of Campbell to, to our narrative. Um, in laying out this monomyth, Campbell described a number of stages of the journey of a hero. So stage number one. The hero's adventure begins in the ordinary world. He must depart from the ordinary, ordinary world when he receives a call to adventure. And remember how in the last week's Parsha, Yaakov sends Joseph to his brothers. Remember that? Okay. And Israel said to Joseph, your brothers are pasturing at Shem. Come, I will send you to them. And he said, here I am, Hineni. Wherever we see this response in the Torah, some character says, Hineni, it marks a transition, a beginning of an adventure. Who else said that? Abraham said Hineni when, uh, the, before the binding of Isaac. Moshe responds Hineni when God calls to him from the burning bush. So here Joseph says the same. He accepts this. He sets out on the journey. And Hineni, it's like a key to the door that hero opens when he goes out. So next stage, stage number two. With the help of mentor, the hero will cross a guarded threshold, leading him to a supernatural world where familiar laws and orders do not apply. So there is a little part of the story which is kind of often overlooked because it's not seems not that important, but it's actually a very important part of this, you know, structure of the myth of this story. When Joseph comes to Shem, what happens? He cannot find his brothers. He got lost, and he's uh, wandering in the desert, and men came to him, and men asked him, what are you looking for? And he said, I'm looking for my brothers, and the strange man shows him the way. So he meets this uh, this person, this character, we don't know who he is, maybe an angel, maybe a man who leads the way, who helps him to go through the threshold into a new world. And he is going to go, obviously, you know, all to Egypt. And this is a drastic change from his normal, ordinary life, his world with his laws and tradition. He goes to a completely different world. So now we understand why the character, the small character, of this man, mysterious man, is important. Next stage, 
the hero will embark on a road of trials where he is tested along the way. And the archetypal hero, he is often uh, assisted by allies. And as the hero faces the ordeal, he encounters the greatest challenges of the journey. And upon rising to the challenge, the hero will receive a reward or a boon, as Campbell, in Campbell's terminology. And boon is something that he can share with, with others. Uh, so Joseph, as you all know, will be sold as a slave to Egypt, and he will resist the seduction of Pot Potiphar's wife. These are all trials, and he will be imprisoned. And in our Parsha, finally he'll be freed from jail. So who is helping him? His ally, right? This is another figure, is a chief cupbearer. So everything just like Campbell described. And then in the last stage, the hero must then decide to return with this boon, to the ordinary world. In our case, Joseph will get this power to save his family from famine, and he'll do that, but no spoilers. That's in the next, <laughs> <laughs> next Parsha. <laughs> so the fundamental structure of the myth applies not only to Joseph's story, but to many other heroes of the Torah. We can think about Moshe, for example. He's also this type of a hero. Um, and not only in the Torah, but uh, not only in Jewish heritage, we see the same pattern in the endless amount of books and movies. So let's think about some movies. For example, Matrix is a good example. Normal guy, uh, the computer programmer, Thomas Anderson, he's awakened to the real world and he sets on this journey to save the world. Um, my, uh, one of my favorite example is Lion King. After Simba is cast out into the strange jungle outside of his pride, he makes uh, peace with his new life and surroundings, and he's enjoying the good life with his two mentors. These are Timon and Pumbaa. And then he comes back to the lion family to save it. And the one is like the most famous example is, of course, Star Wars. Um, well, Luke Skywalker goes from an innocent uh, farmer in some kind of godforsaken planet to a wielder of the force and the hero of the empire. This comes to show us a deep interconnection between human cultures and, the, I believe, the profound importance of Jewish literature in the Western world. And uh, my suggestion that if you ever want to write a novel, or a movie script, <laughs> feel free to use the story of Joseph as an inspiration because it's really it's a golden standard for narratives. You will totally succeed. But this narrative has a purpose, of course. It's not only here to back up Cam Campbell's theory. So what do we learn from Parashat Miketz? As I mentioned before, we're in the middle of this three-part drama. And even that shows the great wisdom of our sages in the way how they laid out the structure, how they divided the text into portions. So the middle part signifies a big transition. It is in the center of the plot because it's a turning point. It's right in the center, not only for Joseph, but for all the main characters of the story. So who was Joseph? Joseph was a boy who used to annoy everyone in his family, and he had all these weird dreams, and we can say that he was not uh, the most considerate uh, you know, person to other people's feelings. And he just uh, told his family, like, everyone will bow, bow to me. And he also delivered bad news about his brothers to Yaakov. So we might say he was a little bit egoistic, maybe spoiled, he was the favorite one. But here in our Parsha, what is the tra transition when he interprets the dream of the Pharaoh, he admits immediately that the power of this in interpretation comes from God, not from him. When he meets his brothers, he doesn't take vengeance on them. He doesn't blame them for what happened. His first reaction when he's seeing them is not that he remembered how they wronged him, but Torah says that he remembered the dream and realized that everything happened because of the will of God. 
it is more than about him and his brothers. It is a cosmic plan that unre un unravels before his eyes. And in this transition from a child to a hero who plays a part that God has assigned him, he stops being egoistic. He's really an opposite of that. He totally trusts God. He totally dedicates himself. And he understands the magnitude of everything that happened to him. But he is not alone who undergoes a, a transformation. We have like successful examples of that and less successful examples of that. So he has two brothers, uh, Reuven and Judah, who played really you know, key role in his enslavement and the way he's been sold to Egypt. So they are facing the same challenging process of transition. So in this chapter, when Joseph demanded that Benjamin, his youngest brother, was to be brought to him, uh, to Egypt, of course, all brother got really scared because they knew that Yaakov would not let Benjamin go. And let's see how first Reuven behaves in this situation. As I said, Reuven and, and Judah, they are two key figures in the process of selling Joseph to slavery. And Reuven was the one who wanted to save him, you remember? And he suggested throwing him into the pit because he wanted them to come back and save him from the pit. And Judah was the one who came with an idea of selling Yosef instead of killing him. So they both kind of maybe wanted to say him, but in a very bizarre way, which didn't work. Um, in our Parsha, it is really a time to repent for what was done and make a tshuva. But uh, in, you know, for Judah and for Oven, but in our Jewish tradition, tshuva is more than just saying, oh, I confess, you know, confess my sins, I'm free. It requires a true transformation and my favorite definition of repentance comes from Maimonides, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this idea that one must change their behavior, and when confronted with the same situation, act differently. So right here, Reuven and Judah, they're kind of confronting a similar situation. Uh, but in this definition of Maimonides that comes from Mishnah Torah, there is a quote that I really, really love, which says that, Among the paths of repentance is for the penitent, penitent to change their name as if to say, I'm a different person and not the same one who sinned. I'm a different person, not the same one who sinned. And when repentance is complete, it means that I'm someone new. It releases me from mistakes of the past and allows me to grow in the future. So when... Yaakov doesn't want to let Benjamin to go to Egypt. First, Reuven approaches Yaakov. Um, he offers him a solution. And he says, what does he say? He says, if I don't bring Benjamin back, you may kill my two sons. I think it's such a wonderful solution. What is he saying to Yaakov? Like, if I will not bring your son back, you can kill your two grandsons instead. I like no wonder Yaakov did not agree to this idea. And but what is important in this process of chuva and transformation, Reuven does not become a new person. See what he's doing. He is ready to sacrifice other people instead of him, so he doesn't change. He is the same person who said to his brothers, I told you not to wrong the boy, but you did not listen. First of all, he didn't tell this, like he didn't tell them not to wrong the boy. But secondly, he's saying, you did not listen. Not my fault, your fault. Kill my children, not me. <laughs> and what did Judah say? He says, he also talks to Yaakov, and he says, send Benjamin in my care. I myself will be surety for him. You may hold me responsible. I will stand guilty before you forever. This is a true transformation. And our sages say that at this moment, Reuven, he actually lost 
his status and the privilege of being a firstborn, because Reuven was a first true child, but a Judah who, becomes, who becomes our great forefather. That's why we're Jews, Yehudim, and we practice Judaism, and we came from Judea. So Judah now is a different person, and not the same one who sinned. Lastly, one more person undergoes transformation. This is Yaakov. His favoritism to Joseph and Benjamin, and essentially to his beloved wife, Rachel, is at the outset of the family conflict and all the following tragic events. He is so angry that his brothers want to take Benjamin to Egypt that he forgets that they are all his children. He doesn't care for the safety of other brothers, and he's telling them, you know, you killed my children. Like, they are not his children. Why he's not worried what happened to them? So he's sending them there knowing that he, they might be imprisoned. Something bad might happen to them. They might be killed. He doesn't care. He only cares about Benjamin. And I imagine that must have been very painful for brothers to see how much Yaakov neglects them. And presumably that was his attitude throughout the entire life. But in this portion he finally comes to peace with his destiny. He says, take your brother and may El Shaddai dispose the man to mercy toward you, that he may release to you your brother as well as Benjamin. As for me, if I am to be bereft, I shall be bereft. This is a powerful statement that shows an infinite trust to God. It is some kind of a you know, task that is similar to Abraham, uh, you know, the Akedat Yitzhak test. Yaakov accepts the ultimate power of God over lives, and he is too transformed. So we have so many transformations in this story, in the middle of our story, and we will see what's going to happen next, next week. But this is, I believe, is the ultimate lesson of our Parsha. Each and every one of us is a hero of a journey. And regardless of the stage that we are according to the monomyth, there is a time for us to change, to repent, to make tshuva, to become someone new. It doesn't matter if you are 30 years old, like uh, Joseph in this story, or more than 100 years old, like Yaakov, there is a time to make a transition. So don't miss your opportunity. Be a hero of your own story. And today, of course, is also a Hanukkah, a Rosh Chodesh, also a lot of symbols of new beginnings and traditions. So I want to offer you in the end kind of a reading of the blessing that we recite on Hanukkah that speaks to me, and hopefully it will speak to you as well. When we read, you know, it's a story of the war, of course, you know, what happened in Hanukkah. But there, there, there are these words that I really like. You, God, delivered the strong into the hands of the weak, the many into the hands of the few, the impure into the hands of the pure, and the wicked into the hands of the just, and the arrogant into the hands of those devoted to your Torah. So think about it, not as people delivered to people, but you before, to you in future. The person that you were before, the person, imperfect person, that kind of a person who did something wrong, you can deliver yourself in the hands of future you. There is always a chance for all of us to change for better. And I'm wishing you a happy Hanukkah, Chodesh Tov, Shabbat Shalom, what else? <laughs> all the holidays.